Good morning, Sonoma Valley Community Church family and friends. My name's Henrik Mann. I'd like to welcome all of you to 181 Chase Street in Sonoma, California. And yes, the magic word this morning is tenderly. God loves us tenderly. And he wants us to love others tenderly, to act justly, and to walk humbly with our God. And so I'd like to invite us to seek God's face with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your goodness, but most importantly, that you love us tenderly, even when we don't always deserve it. Mm -hmm. Thank you that your love is unmerited. Thank you that your love is astounding mm -hmm. and sometimes seems reckless. And it's amazing and it's wonderful and it's comforting and it's gracious and it's kind as truthful, as patient. Thank you. Lord, thank you for the greatness of your love and that you love us tenderly mm -hmm. while we are in the wilderness. Oh, Lord God, there's no measuring of the greatness mm -hmm. of your love. It is greater than when you put our sins as far as the east is in the west and the west into the ocean. Thank you, Lord God, for the greatness of your love. We pray that this morning we might be able to respond, that you would help us to respond to your love. You are the audience of one that matters most this morning. We pray, Lord God, that you would invigorate us to celebrate, to praise, and to acknowledge the greatness of who you are here in Sonoma. We thank you for all the many good gifts you've given us. And this morning, we also acknowledge the privilege and honor and joy that it is to give good gifts to others, especially children in this world. Lord God, we pray that you would help us to be generous and kind and able to love with the love that you have given us. Mm -hmm. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're so glad to welcome you this morning to our service. I'm so grateful for the privilege of being a pastor here with my wife, Charlotte, and Olga. Thank you for playing Rosemary Clooney's rendition of Tenderly. So we're trying new things all the time, and it's been a lot of fun to do some jazz songs here at our church as an opening for reflecting that God has hidden gems in the culture of America and of, of uh, Western culture that remind us of his character qualities. Mm -hmm. And so this morning we want to keep worshiping our Lord and Savior, and uh, we'd like to do that with a wonderful hymn. Would you join us as we, uh, hopefully this works, yep. Oh, yeah, I had this new slide I put in. May you find God's favor, tender mercy, and blessing over your life. I'd like to have everybody whoever watches our services and whoever participates to have that sense that we want to extend the favor of God, the tender mercy of God, and the blessing of God over people's lives. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a, there's a hymn that is actually a Christmas song by tradition uh, that we want to open up with because we're going to start Christmas a little early this year. You know, the stores are doing it. <laughs> People have got Christmas ornaments up already. Um, lights are going up on houses, and I thought that it was appropriate for us to also sing at least one Christmas song every Sunday starting today. So this is the one that uh, just is so appropriate as we uh, enter into the book of Luke that we'll be looking at in a few minutes. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Come to thee, O oh, 
go. sound that saved a wretch like me. We all know it. And here we get to sing it again and just invite God to help us feel the greatness of his grace towards us. Ah. Uh. 
as long as life endures through many dangers toils and snares I have already come tis grace hath brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace when we been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. There's power Amen. in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. And we're going to sing about that. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. For by Him and through There is power in the name of Jesus. There is peace in the name of Jesus. There is peace in the name of Jesus. For by Him and through Him and in Him are all things. Peace in the name of Jesus. There is love. There is love in the name of Jesus. There is love in the name of Jesus. For by Him and through Him and in Him are all things. There is love in the name of Jesus. We are one in the name of Jesus. We are one in the name of Jesus. For by Him and through Him and in Him are all things. We are one in the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance 
after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Something about that name. One more time. When you're awake at night, remember Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. There's just something about that name. Even when you're worried. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. grace and the goodness of God dwell deeply within our hearts and minds so that no matter what is going on around us we may have a still calm center and be able to proclaim it is well with my soul we thank you Lord Jesus for being here in our midst this morning Lord guide the rest of this service in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's so important to communicate with one another. There's so much to be said. And it's not all able to be contained in a worship service. But we do our best. So one of the things that I'd like to do is I'd like to have um, a wonderful person come forward, Pat. And I'd like Pat to tell us what the wonderful display of shoe boxes behind me means. Pat, here's your mic. What's going on? Let's give her a hand. Good morning. A huge thank you to the volunteers and donors. Because of our efforts, we will be able to reach 190 impoverished children around the world. So thank you very much. 190. Now, I got to tell you, God's not always into numbers, but he did count those who came to Christ at Pentecost at 3,000. <laughs> and I got to tell you that last year we did 140 shoe boxes, wow. and this represents a 50 box increase in our community. Let's give the Lord a hand for that. Oh. Amen. <laughs> now, what's inside those boxes? We have school supplies, notebooks, pencils, pens, erasers, pencil sharpeners, crayons, markers. Some have glue sticks for yeah. the older kids. Scissors, calculators, calendars, stickers. We have toiletry items, soap, washcloths, toothbrush. And I even threw in a boom box. A mini boom box. There's all sorts of gifts that people have put in. And uh, you know, that didn't come by accident. That's been taking months of labor to come to this fruition right now. And we want to pray over these boxes that God will send them to the right children 
wherever they are in this world. We are so grateful for the honor and privilege as a, as a church here in Sonoma to send them out. Would you join me in a word of prayer for the children, 190 of them, that are going to, yes? Two more. Okay. So I, I'm mistaken. We are going to be at 192. We got two more this morning. Amen. So let's pray for 192 children. Lord God, our church is birthing love in Jesus' name towards 192 children who were saying, Look, somebody cares. Somebody cared to put this together. We love you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for those who've donated money so that they can be shipped. We thank you for those who've donated money and time and purchased the contents of the boxes. We thank you for those who will be helping to move the boxes. We pray for your Holy Spirit to protect the boxes that they will get all the way into the hands of that unique child on this planet who needs a shoebox. And then we pray, Lord God, that the child will not only have a happy time with the contents and opening up the box, but that they would also reflect that for their entire lives, they might know that God knows their address, that God loves them, and that God has a plan for their lives. Lord, we thank you for the honor, the humble privilege that we've had to participate in making some children's hearts be glad for Christmas. Lord, send them on their way speedily and safely, and may you receive all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Well, we've got a couple of other announcements. There's going to be a leadership meeting this Tuesday. Last week I announced it, and I was wrong. I had mistaken the Tuesday that it's taking place. So it's actually this coming Tuesday at uh, 6 p.m., and anyone is welcome to come and to listen or to give their input into what we're doing as a church. also want to make you aware that the Valley of the Moon Choral Ensemble will be coming and singing here at our church at 5 p.m. on Sunday, December 18th, and also on sun, uh, Sunday, December 19th. The tickets are $35, as far as I know, um, so far. And the Saturday afternoon uh, event may include wine, and there may be a surcharge for that. All the funds go to the Sonoma Community Center to help run their programs. And uh, we're just very grateful for the privilege to host these folks. We're going to do a marvelous job singing various kinds of Christmas songs. And most all the songs are going to be a cappella. So this is going to be very dramatic to have these professional singers come and sing, uh, not even with the use of our wonderful piano. So we just want to praise God for the gift of Christmas that God has, has, has allowed these people to want to do this uh, choral event here at our church for Christmas. Also, uh, just want to um, recognize that, that these shoe boxes are not by accident. If you still want to get in, you've got one day, one day left, unless they're all gone uh, by tomorrow. So if you want to jump in with another box or so, contact Margaret Hagee. All right, with that, we want to um, invite God to help us uh, to, uh, to understand his word. And before that, I want to recognize that on Thursday, there was a federal holiday to recognize and to support the veterans in our country. And we have an impromptu song that's going to be sung by Pastor Tim to just honor all those who've, who've had public service in the military. And I also just want to pray as he's getting up for the military who are represented in our church. Lord God, we thank you for all those who families who have sacrificed and who have taken time to uh, be part of the United States military. Thank you for their honorable service. Thank you for uh, them helping to keep us safe. I pray, Lord God, that uh, you would bless each family uh, who has 
partaken in that service. And for those of us who have relatives who are now in the military, I think of my nephew who's uh, stationed in Georgia. And I pray, Lord God, that you would help all of us to pray for them, pray for our soldiers in a very difficult and tumultuous world that we live in now. In Jesus' name, amen. Tim, come on up. Well, I want to thank the Lord for raising me up from a sick bed this week. Praise God. <clears throat> you probably hear it a little bit in my voice still. Thursday was Veterans Day, as you recall. It was also Remembrance Day in the United Kingdom. Pastor and, his, and Charlotte are going to England soon. And uh, I just reflected on... Uh, the tremendous alliance that we've had with Britain over the years and how God used, uh, used our nations to, to thwart so much evil. And, uh, you know, there's a, <clears throat> I didn't discover this for years, but one of my favorite places in, in uh, anywhere is uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And I didn't know for many years that, you might look this up, but, Behind the altar is the chapel for the American soldier that they built. And uh, it's very touching. And I was thinking about how they came from the farms of Iowa in World War II. And they left the boroughs of New York. They came from the neighborhoods of London. They left the, the plow in Devon. And they laid down all their plans for homes, for family, for prestige, for achievement and answered the call for God and country. What a concept, amen? amen? For God and country, for the preservation of justice, freedom, and the blessings of providence that our countries have known so richly. And so this is a song. It's a traditional British song, but I think that we can share in it since we're such stalwart cousins and uh, the sentiment is shared. I vow to thee, my country, all earthly things above, entire and whole and perfect, the service of my heart above. The love that stands the test, that lays upon the altar the dearest and the best. The love that never falters, the love that pays the price, the love that makes a Modern technology, right? Yeah. There we go. Thank oh, you, sorry. Tim. Thank you, Tim. You know, there's a place 
for ordering your notes and for ordering the service. Got all my notes typed out. Got an order of service all typed out and everything is organized um, and has been contemplated and prayed over. And then there is the impromptu as well, right? And that impromptu is the invitation that we give the Holy Spirit and God to invite him to adjust because we hold our plans loosely in our hands. So we'll see how this service continues and we'll try to end on time. I'm going to uh, need my uh, glasses, Charlotte, and I don't know where they are right this minute. So that's one of those impromptu matters. I had them around somewhere here, but uh, my wife will find a pair and we'll be able to make this work. Thank you, dear. Where would we be without our spouses, right? So let me read for you from the Gospel of Luke, the first 17 verses. And by the way, Tim and uh, Jan are at a memorial service this morning uh, for their son-in-law who passed away from a diving accident. So um, when you see them next, also I believe that Tim's birthday is today. Oh, this Tim. We're going to do one more impromptu thing. Let's pray, have, pray and bless him. Lord, thank you for Tim. And we pray for your blessing upon him, your happy birthday blessing on Tim, who has been such a blessing to the Lord here at our church. We thank you, Lord God, that you raised him out of his sickbed this week and had him able to come and sing that beautiful song. And we pray, Lord God, that as long as you give him breath, that he might always be full of the songs of the Spirit and the hymns and the spiritual songs that you have created in the Bible and in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I won't ask you how young you are. <laughs> That's okay. So here's the word. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of those things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us from those who were the first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you might know the certainty of the things you have been taught. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But, there were ch but they were childless. They had no child. Because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. 
And he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. Well, the Gospel of Luke, as you may be fully aware, if you've had some time in the Bible, is the third of the Synoptic Gospels in the New Testament. A gospel that appeals most to non-Jewish readers because it has a tone and posture of storytelling that highlights women, prayer, the underdog, children, sinners, outcasts, foreigners, and the Holy Spirit, and, in, and an interest in Gentiles in general. It also begins with a somewhat secular prelude of four verses, and then moves into the infancy narrative of John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth, and pulls those two infant, infant stories together, because John the Baptist and Jesus are cousins from the same family tree, as well as linked together as servants of God. I also appreciate that this gospel names and highlights names and titles of Jesus not found in other parts of the Bible. For example, the title Master, Master, is only found in Luke's gospel. The first four verses of Luke's gospel have a deliberately secular style that invites comparison to the his historians of that day. There we go. And the gospel is written to a person named Theophilus, a Greek name that means lover of God. Theo, God, Ophilus, Philo, love, lover of God. We know nothing about this person, but in Luke's eyes, he was a person of substance and distinction who had become acquainted with Christianity and expressed interest in learning the foundational facts of Christianity. Luke has investigated everything very carefully from way back, even back to the events surrounding the birth of Jesus. Attention to the eyewitnesses and sources is matched by an attention to how he lays out the gospel, not as a rambling report, not as a mere chronicle, but rather as a coherent message to someone who would have had a point of view like Theophilus, a Greek-born seeker into the things of God, but not necessarily yet a full-blown Christian and not necessarily a follower of Jesus as Master, Savior, and Lord. Luke wants to be respectful of both faith and history. With writing, a writing approach that is able to highlight the purpose of God in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Nazarene. Luke is interested in building undeniable confidence in those who would take time to read and study that gospel that he has written and is writing. Undeniable confidence. Do we have an open mind and heart to the things of God that occur in human affairs? Do we have undeniable confidence in the scriptures as God-inspired and accurate in presenting God's wisdom and work in the world? Luke wants us to be confident. Luke wants us to be knowledgeable and Luke wants us to be convinced, convinced. These days, Bibles are still banned and censored in 52 countries, 52 countries. The battle for an unaltered Bible is still part of the struggle that people and God have to this very day. Finding an unalterable, an unaltered Bible in the heart language of, of, of every people on this earth is a constant logistical and spiritual and political struggle 
that has never ended since Luke wrote this gospel and the book of Acts. People are still fighting. The president of China wants to rewrite the Bible or suppress it. And it's just incredible that here in 2021, the Bible is not welcome in 52 countries. The brief preamble ends, the birth narrative begins in verse 5. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Click, click, click. All right, well, I'll just have to go up here and... Uh, did that move it? Yep. Yeah, maybe Charlotte, you want to be there. <laughs> Help me along it a little bit. A uh, brief preamble begins in verse 5 with a focus on a specific married priest, Zacharias, who is going about his life's duty and carrier with all career with all the faithfulness, consistency, and honor to God that he can possibly muster in his time and culture. He's an older man. And interestingly, the opportunity to enter into the Holy of Holies and burn prayerful incense to God in the Golden Temple in Jerusalem is determined by the casting of lots. We've considered this issue of casting of lots when we were looking in the book of Jonah together and how the sailors determined that Jonah was the guilty party by casting lots. And in this case, the casting of lots narrowed 24,000 priests down to one particular priest who would represent all the people of Israel, over a million people, in the presence of God. And it was hoped that this man would not do anything to anger God or bring shame upon the nation of Israel. And so they always had a little rope tied to the guy so that if he went into the Holy of Holies to represent the people and God was displeased and killed him on the spot, they could pull the body back out of there without having anybody else die. Both Zacharias and Elizabeth felt the weight of all of that. And God says in this, in this verse 6, they were both righteous before God. Not just Zacharias, but his wife as well. They were righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. So as far as God is concerned, they're living in accordance with his pleasure. Interestingly enough, that wasn't necessarily the view of the culture and of the people who knew them because they didn't have children. Interestingly also, both of them come from the line that goes all the way back to Aaron, the brother of Moses. Aaron is described in the book of Exodus as a son of Amram, Amram and Jochebed of the tribe of Levi, three years older than the than his brother Moses. Aaron acted together with his brother in the desperate situation of the Israelites in Egypt and took an active part in the Exodus and in their liberation from bondage. Although Moses was the actual leader, Aaron acted with his mouth. The two brothers went to Pharaoh together, and it was Aaron who told Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go, not Moses using his magic rod in order to show the might of Yahweh. When the Pharaoh finally decided to release his peop the people, Yahweh gave the important ordinance of the Passover, the annual ritual remembrance of the Exodus to Aaron and Moses. But Moses went up on Mount Sinai alone. It was only later that Aaron was ordered by Moses to bring near Aaron and his sons, and they were anointed and consecrated to be priests by a perpetual statue. Aaron's sons were to take over the priestly garments after him. And so it went generation after generation all the way to Zechariah the priest. What Luke wants to emphasize in this verse is that both Zechariah 
and Elizabeth were righteous in the sight of God, observing all God's commandments. Remember that there was also the case of Job of old and certain others in the Bible, like Enoch, who were godly people with whom God was well pleased. But in this case, Zechariah and Elizabeth were childless. They suffered in their marriage, their long marriage, with not having children. And here they are coming up to meet with God, and they know that there's a possibility that Zechariah might be killed because he's displeased the Lord in some way. Whoop, that, I didn't do that. Just leave it there. Thanks. <laughs> I wish this thing worked. I don't know why it's not working. But um, So while he's serving as priest, here he is, and everything depends on him. What if Christianity for this year depended just on you and your walk with God? What if the question of this opening of Luke was, was this. What if all faith depended upon just you? That's what was happening here. It was only Zechariah who was going to go up. And if he had been the cause of their childlessness, which people assumed he displeased God somehow, then he would probably die. So his whole career and his marriage to Elizabeth was on the line because God's finger through the lot had found him and asked him to go and burn incense at the altar. It's a pretty profound question to ask. What if it all depended on you? What if it all depended on this church? What if the stakes of cosmic good and evil depended upon these boxes going out into the world? and they touch another Billy Graham, or they touch a prophet of the Lord. Remember, it had been 400 years of God being silent, and all of a sudden, Zechariah, who's coming into the presence of God, all of a sudden gets the surprise of his life because God actually shows up. He should have expected it, but... It was a surprise. Now their condition is a condition that God knew about. Next slide, please. God's able to know the condition of our lives. They had no child, the scripture says, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in years. It took my wife and I five years to conceive our, our second child, Christopher, before that, when we had our daughter Emily, it took us five years from the time we got married to have our daughter. Each child, it took five years for us to have that child. And so I know just a smidgen of what it means to wait. And I also know that God loves those who may not have a child. God raises up Elizabeth in the scriptures and throughout the Bible, those women who happen to bear the challenge of infertility are raised up into God's story to be mighty, mighty women of God. How would you like to be the mother of John the Baptist? But it meant taking all your life to wait for that event. What I like about this story as it opens up is that God speaks to senior people and God does miracles in the lives of those who are older than 60 years old. I'm not there yet, but it's amazing to me that God uses this story in the lives of people who are older to remind them that God isn't finished with us yet. Next slide, please. God has a pathway that we may not anticipate for each of us. 
My path may not be what I had expected, but I'm so glad the Lord isn't done with me yet. You know, there's a terrible angst, a terrible fear that gets into people's hearts and lives as we get older, that like we've missed, we've, we, we've, the best years of our lives are done, and we don't have anything more to really contribute. And, and God is saying through Elizabeth to you this morning, and through Zechariah to you this morning, and to us, that the best is yet to come, and that God hasn't finished with us yet. Amen? Amen. Amen. And even if we don't have a child, God is still able to do miracles in our lives and to write us into his great story. I'm so grateful that God isn't finished with us yet, isn't finished with me yet, and that he has more for us. Let's go to verse 11. Next slide, please. Thank you, God, for moving us from history to spiritual encounter with an angel named Gabriel. So here's what verse 11 and 12 say. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. So here we have a situation where all of a sudden, the whole career, the whole life, of Zechariah comes down to this moment and God shows up through the angel Gabriel. God had an amazing way of surprising Zechariah. You know, I wouldn't have been surprised if Zechariah had a heart attack. You know, uh, all of these encounters that people have with God tend to have when they're this kind of an encounter tend to have a shock factor. And it's interesting to me to notice with you that the first thing that happened in Zechariah's heart and mind is that he was troubled and, he, and fear fell upon him. Why did fear fall upon him? Well, I guess because he thought that somehow he had missed God's plan for his life. And now he was going to face judgment before God. And it is a wonderful thing to notice that that was not what was going on at all. The reality of Zechariah's feelings was totally mistaken in where God was coming from. Nothing could be further from the truth. But it, uh, but it was a time of fear and feeling that his life and life's work were over. And I don't belittle it, neither does God. I want to say that this visitation from God to an old man was meant to confirm the promise of the birth of John the Baptist as one crying in the wilderness, as a forerunner of the long-awaited Messiah and the beginning of the end of the age. But it was also, also has a secondary purpose. It allows all of us to, who think our lives are over and long past that we can still be a special part of God's plan and that God talks to senior people. In fact, it may be the truth that we don't really get going in our relationship with God until we hit about 60 years old. He works with seniors, and seniors are often the most spiritually sensitive in the different ages and stages of a human being's life. They're usually the most spiritually sensitive to the work of God in their lives and in the world around them if their heart and mind are open to God. There's plenty of old people who are calloused and insensitive and unwilling to listen to God. So I'm not saying that's not the, that, that those people don't exist. But what I am saying is that God speaks many times in Scripture, not to a young kid, but to an older person. Does God want to speak to seniors in Sonoma this week? Does God want to speak to seniors in this church? I would say yes, indeed, without a doubt. But you might feel afraid of talking to God. 
Maybe you don't feel worthy. Maybe you have regrets in your life. Maybe you fear judgment from God. I will tell you that there are all sorts of reasons that people give for why they don't want to meet God directly. Let the pastor do that. Let someone else do that. You know? But Zechariah and Elizabeth were, in fact, good with God. And the angel had to get him refocused on the message and off the uniqueness and ambiguity of experiencing God through an angel. And the first four words of the angel are some of the most common instructions of God to people in the Bible. What does he say? The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you're to give him the name John. Amen, John? Amen, John. My middle name is Jonathan. I picked it when I was 13. I wasn't a Christian at the time, but my heart was drawn to Jonathan. I don't know why, it just was, and I knew that it meant gift of God. And here, the angel has a message from the throne of heaven to Zechariah that his prayers that he's been praying all these years are going to be finally answered. And God is ready to say these words to get the message going. Do not be afraid. Zechariah may have struggled, but his struggle was really one of just being very human. I'm going to stop my message there because i am not got enough time to f do the rest. Because we're going to end as close to on time as possible. But it's a good place for us to end. Do not be afraid. What is it that we fear? Do we fear God? I'd like to suggest that there's a way in which we are to fear God, and there's a way in which we're not to fear God. God calls us this morning to open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds to his presence. And I just want to encourage you that if you're alive, if you're breathing, if you're here in this sanctuary this morning, God has more in store for you. Amen? Amen? God has more in store for you. And uh, he has more in store for me and more in store for my wife and I. I wished we could have another child. Two seems to be all that we're ever going to get physically. But there's other ways in which we can have children. And this morning, those shoe boxes represent a church that has just birthed a relationship with 190 children. And I just want to praise God. Oh yeah, 192. <laughs> Our church is very fertile. 192. And I want to take that number away with me today as a sense of encouragement that God isn't finished with us yet. There's room for more. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for you being a God that opens a door to more, to more possibility, to more love, to more grace, to more children. And Lord God, we pray that you would do a special work in our hearts to be open to the possibility that you have more in store for Sonoma Valley Community Church, that you can open the doors to children in this church, that you can open the doors to young teenagers in this church, that you can open the doors of this church to young families. Oh, Lord God, we humble ourselves before you and invite you to have a mighty visitation with us and to answer the prayers of the founders of this church, that this church might be a glory to God. So I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we close, I'd like to have Cat Miles, come forward. Cat Miles is coming forward right now, and Char and I are just going to lay hands on her and pray for a minute because she's wanting to come forward to be a new member in our church. And while we have still other aspects of that process to go through, I wanted to just acknowledge that Cat wants to come forward and be a member of this church. Amen. <laughs> Charlotte, would you pray for Cat? Lord God, we thank you for this uh, home, this church home, 
and we come as your hands and feet to serve and love this community. And we thank you for Kat coming and asking, how can I be part of this family? So Lord, we pray that you would bless her as she seeks to serve you in this community. We thank you for her life that is a light into a dark world. We pray that you would fill her and go with her and encourage her. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you and you. welcome into our fellowship. She'll be having an interview with the leadership and, uh, and, we'll, and if any of you are not yet members of our church, you're welcome to let me know and have you come forward. We'll pray for you and we'll just uh, continue that process and then you'll be drafted into the membership of this church. So with that, why don't we stand and close the service with the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's have some fellowship together and let's give God the praise and glory for what he's done through our, our wonderful little church with a huge heart. God bless you. Why did you do that? Did you do that?